um, to the meeting of scrutiny and performance. And today uh, we have um, colleagues from the Scottish Government who are here as witnesses for our procurement and commissioning review. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind members that this meeting is being recorded and will be subsequently available for, for public listening. On the subject of recording, I would ask you to ensure that you use your microphones at all times when speaking and that you speak clearly into the microphone. Um, Sederant, an apologies. Good morning. We have seven members present today. I have apologies from councillors Gilroy, Dykes and councillor Karen Crothers. Um, item two, declarations of interest. No declarations. Item three, we'll move on to the minute of the 25th of February 2014. Can we take that as a correct record? Agreed. Item four, minute of meeting of 29th of April. Can we take this as a correct <coughs> record? No dissent. Move on. Now move on to item five. Scrutiny review, procurement and commissioning, presentation and evidence session with Scottish Government report by Assistant Chief Executive. This first report is an evidence session with, with expert witnesses and I'm therefore delighted to welcome again representatives from the Scottish Government. We have Colin Judge, Principal Advisor, Construction Procurement Policy, Laurie Wilcox, Procurement Capability Development Manager, Caroline Kniffy, Senior Policy Implement Officer and Calamor Construction Procurement Policy Officer. Um, now, my understanding is you're going to do it two and two with the uh, project bank accounts first. So, if you'd like to take us through that and maybe just let us know which two is two it is. No. with me please. Uh, my name is Colin Judge, um, again from Scottish Government, I'm a Principal Construction Advisor. Uh, I'm here to talk about project bank accounts today. Um, excuse me a second please. It's just to retrieve the presentation please. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know. Was <laughs> wire somewhere? Um, are we still on here? Yes. Um, Sorry for the way, thanks for bearing with me. Um, there's an issue regarding late payment in the construction sector. It was picked up upon by the review of procurement in construction by Ken Lewandowski and Robin Crawford. Um, basically, in terms of the construction industry, uh, the core principles of cash flow in construction contracts are that payment will be made in arrears based on the client's assessment of the value of work in progress on site. Now, traditional payment processes channel cash due to the supply chain through the lead contractor's business bank account, and that's really the issue that can lead to late payment and where they're embedded in contractual terms and conditions, extended payment terms for subcontractors. Now, we know that subcontractors these days um, deliver most of the work on site in public works contracts, and therefore they are the businesses that really require payment for their outlay on labour plant and materials as soon as practic practicable after they've made that initial expenditure. However, in consultation with ministers, senior officials, we think that payment of firms in public works supply chains 
really needs to be seen in a much broader macroeconomic context in which the revenue accrued from general taxation is invested into infrastructure projects, which translates into contract opportunities uh, for the private sector, through which not only the primary objective of the project in question is realised, but they also provide opportunities for secondary spending in local economies, um, which generates tax revenue, creating scope for other investment in public infrastructure. Now, this virtuous cycle of revenue, investment, spending, and back to revenue at the macroeconomic level is disrupted and jeopardised when money at project level, which is due to one firm by another, is withheld longer than is necessary, or indeed longer than is stipulated in conditions of contract. Now, while this may benefit a few hundred or indeed thousand shareholders of relevant firms in the construction sector, it completely underachieves the full potential for local economies and, by cumulative extension, the nation as a whole. And there are some quotes that we can see from, first of all, the Chair of the Review of Procurement and Construction, followed by the Minister for Transport and Veterans and Deputy First Minister. And I think that exemplifies the broader context through which the problem of late payment is seen by, by ministers and key influencers in the Scottish public sector. Taking some key themes from the quotes, um, beginning with, with culture. Now, we know that late payment is an embedded part of the construction sector. There's no real economic imperative for a self-regulated change to what's, in effect, a profitable behaviour pattern for some firms, but by no means all. Um, so some form of intervention is required to change that behaviour, to change that culture, and to improve it uh, for the majority. In terms of references in the quotes to the broader Scottish economy, we know that cash flow is the, life, cash flow is the lifeblood of business, um, and that prompt payment in that context helps realise the full potential of infrastructure investment across the broader economy, not just within the construction sector, or clearly the construction sector is important enough in itself. We know, for example, that the construction sector in Scotland employs something like uh, uh, 172,000 people. We think it's nearer 176,000. Um, we know that, for example, it, uh, there are 18,000 registered businesses in Scotland that have construction as their main sector, and that 99% uh, 90, of registered businesses in Scotland are actually Scottish-owned and Scottish-operated. So there's a huge imperative to ensure that cash flow accrues to those businesses which in fact are Scottish, and then those businesses can continue to exist to build our national infrastructure. Um, in terms of the final uh, item I'd like to bring out from these quotes here, references to greater resilience, we know that cash flow activates money for not just the benefit of the construction sector, but wider societal benefit. And that cash flow would otherwise rel be relatively dormant and inaccessible in main contractors' business bank accounts. I mean, project bank accounts, in effect, are simply a way of ensuring that firms in a public work supply chain are paid in the shortest possible time. The ring-fenced, trust-based accounts that provide a direct, concurrent and simultaneous payment to supply chain firms, um, that includes the main contractor as well. What project bank accounts do is equalise the main contractor in the supply chain to the level of subcontractors and depending on the penetration down the supply chain of the project bank account to sub-subcontractors. So compared to traditional payment means, payments bypass the weak contractor's business bank account, therefore removing any scope for delays and removing any incentive that may exist within main contractors to withhold payment due to subcontractors. They're underpinned by legal trust status, which, if properly and effectively set up, can protect subcontractors' payments from uh, an insolvent weak contractor or indeed those acting on behalf of an insolvent weak contractor, an administrator or liquidator or whatever. From the council, council's perspective, um, that could protect the council from potentially having to pay twice for the same thing once to a contractor just prior to an unknown forthcoming insolvency and potentially again to the subcontractors if that money hasn't been paid on by the insolvent contractor or by those acting on the insolvent contractor's behalf. Um, and I think the final point is, is quite important. The payments are made electronically. Project bank accounts lend themselves to internet banking. 
they don't necessarily have to be set up in that way, but um, it kind of eases the, the machinery for them to be set up. So, and we're really looking at a period of five days after the payments are deposited by the client into the project bank account from when, and to when the subcontractors, including the main contractor, are paid what they're due for work done on site to that date. Uh, and the benefits are clear. They, they boost cash flow for all the, films that, all the firms that belong to the project bank account and that then allows them to recover their initial expenditure on labour labor plant and materials. Be stuck in the loop here. So. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think the key enabler is to ensure that the various levels of the supply chain that wish to participate in the project bank account have their dates for payment aligned as much as possible with the head contract. And I'd characterise the head contract as being between in this context the council and its immediate main or lead contractor. So that means that supply chain firms have the same assessment date, due date, and the last date at each payment cycle. And the term last date refers to legislation, the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act of 1996, the Associated Scheme for Construction Contracts 1998, and amendments made thereto were enacted uh, by the Scottish Parliament in November 2011. So these are kind of legal terminology, if you like. Um, we're really looking to facilitate the deepest penetration to the supply chain. In doing so, that requires most preparation, communication, and crucially, cooperation from supply chain firms. One would think that uh, firms that are guaranteed payment for work done on site within five days rather than weeks or months would, be, would jump at the opportunity to join a project bank account. Construction industry is a naturally cautious and conservative industry and requires, in the most part, to be persuaded of the benefits, even when they're clear, of new ways of doing things. As I mentioned earlier, it's characterised by uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, um, most of which possibly don't carry a huge administrative setup. They're used to doing things the way they've always done them, even if that means waiting for weeks or months for payment. They kind of know that payment will come. What we're trying to do with project bank accounts as part of the whole payment agenda is to get payment to these firms quicker. So there will be an element of change that's required not only by public bodies, but by the contractors that participate. But that can be supported. Um, and that's the kind of level of detail that I think that the council would wish to. We can follow up in, in, in due course. Um, the policy of assumed inclusion and why exclusion can be justified by any kind of exceptional explanation, what that does is it creates the potential for understanding why firms would wish to exclude themselves from a project bank account and then that would then provide evidence to feed into a policy review around prompt payment generally and if necessary specifically project bank accounts. Reasons why a contractor might um, exclude themselves, so a subcontractor might exclude themselves. For example, you might have, say, a national materials supplier that provides materials, sand and aggregate, etc., to a contractor across several jobs, invoices in bulk for that um, bulk delivery. It doesn't disaggregate that delivery according to various sites. So embedded culture in, in that particular scenario would make it's incompatible with project bank accounts. And there are other examples, for example, national firms who are really not vulnerable to late payment, who set their own terms and conditions, builders, merchants, suppliers, etc., who dictate their terms to lead contractors and who expect payment. If they don't get payment, they simply don't deliver the next time the building contractors are looking for a delivery. That, that, that's how it works. Most subcontractors, however, being small and medium enterprises, are vulnerable to late payments, and pro project bank accounts is one way of dealing with that. It's important to bear in mind that the further the firms are from the, the head contract in the supply chain, the greater the challenge will be to align their payment cycles with that of the head contract. Some pump priming really has to take place in uh, collaboration between the public body and the, the main contractor, 
that itself requires Naveen Contractor to be willing to step up to that role to help with communications with the supply chain and to help the supply chain understand that it's really in their best interests. Again, I would say that the uh, construction industry is naturally cautious, naturally conservative. Probably a degree of persuasion would be required. We are hoping at Scottish Government level um, that the main sectoral trade bodies, for example, the Specialist Engineering Contractors Group, led by uh, Professor Woody Klein, uh, could perhaps get involved in helping Scottish Government roll out a policy around about project bank accounts in terms of communicating with supply chain firms and helping them overcome their understandable and natural caution about um, adopting new ways of doing things. In terms of the payment process, uh, project bank accounts separate and simplify the constituent parts uh, for paying firms in public work supply chains without actually changing the fundamental, fundamental components of them. Um, there's a bit of quantity surveying speak here. Um, most payment regimes can be characterised as one of three types, time-related, activity-related and proportion-related. The time-related is probably the one that we are all aware of, whereby a traditional, what's called measure and value, occurs every month for work done in arrears on site, and the quantity surveyor leads on that. Activity-related would be physical milestone payments, for example, uh, your building up to DPC or damp proof course level would be one stage. Walls up to eaves would be another. Completion of roof structure would be another. These are, these are demonstrable um, activities that can be seen and inspected on site and then the completion of those stages would release payment due for work done to date. Even better if those payments can be predetermined by an analysis of the bills of quantities, simply taking out the relevant elements, adding them up, agreeing with the contractor before work starts on site that the elements in his tender will give rise to a certain payment based on the cumulative value of each of the physical milestone payments that have been predefined. Proportion related um, refers to percentage stage payments. That's uh, favoured by Transport Scotland, who have a system whereby they look at percentages of roadworks completed. Uh, and it's not necessarily aligned with what you would see on site. It's, it's perhaps more to do with the delivery of materials, the amount of tonnage in terms of blacktop, uh, road surfacing, um, aggregates, etc. Um, civil engineering have slightly different ways of doing things relative to the building industry per se. It's best to keep the processes for valuation separate and consecutive. So in the first instance, it's tradi the traditional process whereby the council's quantity surveyor or those acting on, on that behalf um, would certify the payment due to the main contractor as normal. Then the public body would deposit the funds into the project bank account for the amount certified for no more than that. And the payments authorised from the project bank account are then paid into the respective business accounts of subcontractors that are participating. Um, the actual processes are unchanged. Project bank accounts do not require the public body to have any part whatsoever in managing the contractor's supply chain and certainly not in calculating, agreeing or certifying payments due from the main contractor to subcontractors. The slight change that is required in project bank accounts is that the weak contractor must provide a schedule of amounts for payment to be paid out of the project bank account to the subcontractors so that the public body has visibility on that. And if what's called a dual authorisation model is adopted. That's to say that payments out of the project bank account are authorised jointly by the public body and the weak contractor. The public body is assured that no more is being paid out than has been agreed by the main contractor and participating firms in the project bank account within the supply chain. Rest assured that in agreeing to the amounts that the main contractor has certified to his supply chain, you're not endorsing as a public body anything, any money that's due to a subcontractor um, in a contractual relationship that you're not a party to. In other words, you don't accrue or develop any additional contractual rights or responsibilities compared to an, um, a traditional payment process. Um, project bank accounts can actually be retrofitted, uh, built into pre-existing terms and conditions. Usually at framework level, and we have three projects here, one in the vicinity that I think is 
due to get up and running um, sometime in the third quarter, possibly in the cusp of the fourth quarter. Um, it requires work, it requires cooperation, it requires agreement from the main contractor to fit these, this system into his way of working. The main contractor will possibly take a hit in terms of the loss of utility of cash flow due to subcontractors that would normally flow through his bank account in the first instance. We've been very fortunate to have cooperative main contractors. Graham Construction at Monklands Hospital have helped us. Um, we're working with Morrison, who retain their Scottish identity. They're part of the Gallifer Tri Group, uh, which is based in England. And uh, Balfour Beatty, we know, and I think Balfour Beatty have a, a local presence given their work on the, uh, the South East, sorry, the South West Hub. Um, ideally, if you're going to use project bank accounts, you would want to use them at tender as part of a non-negotiable condition of contract that tenders know they are going to have to sign up to. In so doing, they can build in what they perceive to be the cost of project bank accounts, not only in the loss of utility of money that would have flown through their bank accounts, but also in any setting up costs, staff training, that can be reflected, if they wish, in whole or part, in their tender back to the public body for delivery of the main contract. Um, some things for yourselves to consider in due course. I think project selection is important. It's to be an appropriate project. And I've given some you know, rules of thumb in the third indented bullet point there. Not a technically challenging project, a, there's such a thing, a, a run-of-the-mill project, the sort of thing that the council delivers day and daily, year and yearly, preferably over a million pounds, although there is no golden threshold as such, um, and certainly over four months' duration. The reason for four months is because we, we would prefer project bank accounts to be tested over a series of payment cycles, not just, not just two or three. Most construction projects are delivered in significant construction projects are delivered in the period beyond four months. Um, from our perspective, moving up to the second indented bullet point, um, if it's possible to have a project identified and up and running by the end of the financial year, that would help us a great deal in boosting our numbers of trial projects. Uh, and there would be technical assistance available to the council if it wished to pursue that route. I'll be honest with you, the reason I'm saying before the end of the financial year is that we are not certain the extent to which we will carry over a budget for technical assurance that we could provide to the Council beyond the end of this current financial year. The Council would probably wish to check its standing orders. In terms of the governance of a project bank account, are you empowered and would you wish to open a joint account with a lead contractor? Are you able to and would you wish to be a trustee in a project bank account? And would you want to authorise payments out of that account to subcontractors alongside a weak contractor? Or would you wish to have the weak contractor open the, the bank account himself? Would you wish the weak contractor to be a sole trustee? Or would you wish the weak contractor to solely authorise payments of monies that have been deposited into the project bank account by the Council? I would also say that the Council probably would have to think about appointing an internal change project manager and really empower them with the ability to interconnect across your entire business, across your entire operations. Um, I talked earlier about the natural conservatism among the construction industry. This way of doing things would require slight changes in how the council does its business. Probably more so in the minds of staff it could be perceived to be a huge change. It's not really, so they would require to be supported through that transition. And we would ask that if you're going to take forward a pilot project that you, you know, open the dialogue and, and maintain that with ourselves. On your behalf, um, we're forming a, a community of practice among our pilot projects and from that we are develop we're, we're seeing how policy is being interpreted in different contexts, how procedures are being developed according to governance within other public bodies and from that we're, we're learning lessons and that will feed forward into Scottish Government's policy review. Um, I mentioned earlier we have some technical support that's available. That could be made available to the Council, but uh, it, it, for, a, for a limited time in the first instance, simply because of budget uncertainties and from our perspective. Really, from the Council's perspective, 
there's a potential good news story here to be seen to be at the forefront of investing in local business and keeping them afloat where cash flow might otherwise actually put them out of business. And there's an opportunity to really, um, I think, ultimately embed greater social cohesion by keeping businesses afloat, keeping people in work, job security, and recycling that initial infrastructure investment into the local economy through secondary, tertiary spending, and then back into the, the taxation revenue uh, from which other infrastructure investment projects can be uh, led. So, um, I'm not quite sure if we're taking questions now or after the other piece. Happy to take questions now. Thanks very much. Um, it looks, on the face, it quite easy to put in place, etc. You just put a bank account in place and pay out at the proper time. Is there any drawbacks that you can think of? You know, will we see possibly the main contractor doing more of the work, less work going to local subcontractors because, well, part of the quote may have been that we hold on to the money a wee bit longer and that mm. covers our costs. And do you think that possibly you might see an actual rise in quotes for the work because of that fact that they're not able to hold on to the money as long mm -hmm. and they have to get out the door quicker? It's absolutely, it's, it's a fair point. Um, evidence so far from England, public bodies in England that have been using project bank accounts for the last six, seven years would suggest that um, main contractors aren't changing their business models to accommodate project bank accounts. If they're introduced as a condition of tender, condition of contract for carrying out the works, then clearly there's the opportunity for the contractor to look at what he thinks it will cost him in terms of extra cost and rec recouping losses for, let's face it, the utility of money that doesn't belong to him and never has. Um, so that could generate a fundamental change in that element of the, the, the business model, and it could be reflected in tenders. Um, in terms of the likelihood of firms redesigning surgically their business model to take on board more direct labour, I have to say that would, have to, that would remain to be seen. I would be sceptical that would be the case at the top level of national UK contractors. Councillor Maitland. Um, it's, I think it's a technical term, uh, sort of deep penetration into the, um, into whatever it was. I, mean, I think I understand what you're talking about. Um, uh, how, how far down does this go? Because presumably it could stop at one, one subcontractor and not filter down because I mean, we've suffered in Dumfries and Gallery from exactly this. I think everybody knows the one we mean, which really caused great anguish that a very good business Mm -hmm. uh, went out of business for exactly this reason um, locally on a contract with one of our contracts um, and it, um, it, we, we could not intervene. So is, is, you know, for how far down the line does it go and will it stop that sort of thing happening? Because we could not intervene as the client because it would have jeopardised our position, I think. Okay. Um, that's actually a very good point. Uh, policy in... The UK government, ostensibly England, is that they are seeking their central government departments to apply project bank accounts to 80% of the supply chain. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't recall whether that's by value or by volume, and that's a target that they require that departments, they being central government, they require departments to set. In terms of Scottish government, we're still forming our policy on that. To What we're looking at is adopting a potential policy of Ex, um, inclusion unless exclusion can be justified so there would be an opt-in presumption in terms of project bank accounts. Um, I mentioned earlier that some subsectors of construction may not naturally be aligned to the benefits of project bank accounts and these are firms that are you know, not naturally susceptible to a later extended payment and who basically set the, the, the terms. I know that in Northern Ireland there was particularly a um, corporate failure two or three years ago that gave rise to some um, political waves, really, that resulted in Northern Ireland adopting project bank accounts. And they're seeking um, a level of penetration, which I think goes down to Tier 3. And if I can clarify what I mean by that, uh, we, would clarify, we would say that Tier 1 is the lead contractor, 
Tier 2 are his subcontractors, and Tier 3 are what we call the sub-subcontractors. Now, as we know, um, anything below the public contract, for example, below the, the council lead contractor contract, is essentially a private contract. Um, so we could strongly encourage the use of project bank accounts in those private contracts. And the point I mentioned earlier about uh, collaboration and cooperation of the main contractor, I think, uh, comes into play here. Um, because, yes, the main contractor would lose the utility of the cash that otherwise would have gone into his bank account. Um, but ministers are quite clear that the broader macroeconomic, macroeconomic benefits of prompt payment to firms that deliver the work on site is of a higher priority than you know, benefiting shareholders of large construction firms. Um, does, does that answer your question? Thank you. Councillor Crothers. Thanks, Chairman. I think similar, it was a similar question to what uh, Councillor Mayton asked there, but what the, the bits I've put doing is what effect does the PPE have on the main contractor, subcontractor, sub subcontractor, which you've already touched on, mm -hmm. their relationship? Uh, it's almost like does the, does the main contractor just become a. You've got two points, I think, where I've touched on. Do they, do, do they then start just organise, stop going into subcontractors, or do they by, by just. Uh, uh, creating their own direct labour organisation, or is there a relationship uh, between the subcontractors, sub subbies, and so on? Just how I'm just really interested to understand how that because it's bound to change. Can I, I can see such a change because mm -hmm. in in a degree as it stands at the moment, they've got a, de a, a degree of control. You should, I should say over over the influence how they influence the actual subcontractors and sub subbies. But that you feel like that could be taken away. I understand mm -hmm. all the reasons why mm -hmm. that's been put in, uh, why that's been created. Do we have any? Uh, do you have any experience or examples where you, where you could say that this is this is what we've implemented it? This is the experience we've had. Whether it's England or is there any in Scotland that, that we've seen and the positive and negative benefits? What we've seen from that? Uh, what else? I, I picked up and I thought it's a wee bit bureaucratic uh, in regards to the whole system as well. I was picking up and you touched on the costs, etc., mm -hmm. uh, making it a non-negotiable condition. You said, wonder again, what real effect would that have on the? On the bigger companies, what are they thinking about that? What are the big companies like some Morrison's, Balfour Beatty, Fairclough and such like? What are they actually thinking about this whole uh, concept? Okay, um, and, and to, okay, we'll take the last point first, and uh, you might have to remind me about the other points, but uh, hopefully that will be okay. Um, certainly, the firms that I mentioned, um, on on the face of things, are happy to embrace that change and are working directly with uh, our, our agents of that change. In that context, it's National Services Scotland, the Scottish Futures Trust. Transport Scotland and um, Western Isles Council are taking forward a pilot project. That wasn't one of the ones that I mentioned in a limited space. Um, and the relationship between main contractor and subcontractor, I think if we look at their ability to control their supply chain through the stick of withholding payment, is that really the kind of business relationship that's going to be healthy in the long term? It's certainly not currently, and it is leading to subcontractors, you know, Choosing not to work in the public sector, or you know, if they're not being paid, going out of business. You know what we're what we're about really is getting the maximum possible um, participation of the Scottish business and commerce community in delivering Scottish public contracts. Our pilots are at a very early stage. Um, you may have picked up on one of the bullet points that the first payment at Monkwins Hospital was only made last month. There are other pilots coming on stream, and what we're going to do is. Uh, roll out a kind of lessons learned programme, picking up actual experience from these projects as we go on to actually find out the sort of things that you, you've touched on there, sir. Um, I can say that, to my knowledge, no subcontract firm that's been part of a project bank account in England has gone out of business through late payment. It, it hasn't happened. We all know, I'm sure, of plenty of firms that have gone out of business through late payment in other payment mechanisms, that's to say traditional payment mechanisms. mechanisms. The project bank account setup um, doesn't impinge, we think, on the main contractor's ability to manage his supply chain. We think that the main contractor should still be able to manage the delivery of the public contract without the incentive, disincentive from the subcontractor's point of view, of not being paid for what done on site. 
there's, there's a bigger picture to be looked at here, and that's the bigger picture that ministers are, are focusing on. There's no, nothing to the extent that we're aware of in England that firms have, main contract firms have increased in size by forming direct labour, thereby cutting out subcontractors. That model of delivery is still, still persists as far as we're, we're aware in England. Now, honestly, that's not to say that things wouldn't be different in Scotland. We're at very early stage yet. And that would certainly be an, uh, um, an aspect that we'd be keen to, to monitor. Again, uh, which is obviously an evidence session, I would suggest that project bank accounts in and of themselves perhaps wouldn't be enough to require such a re-engineering of the way that uh, the contracting industry delivers public works contracts to the extent that they would build up their DLOs back to the way they were perhaps maybe 40, 50 years ago. Councillor Viper. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, I've got a couple of points. One, I'm, I'm curious how the, the the situation works with you, you touched on it earlier on about um, a big a big supply firm who you, you mentioned sand and aggregate. Mm. Say there was there was three um, projects going on in Dumfries and Galloway, and it was bar quarries, for instance, that were supplying. <coughs> they, they wouldn't want to deal direct with each project. They'd just like to set deliver all the sand aggregate to the three different projects and then build the council for, in one go. Is that, is that what you were meaning? No, it was um, the example that we've, we've seen in England is that that type of subsector tends to uh, build the main contractor in bulk on a single invoice for a series of deliveries made across a period of time to several sites. So, And the invoice, as, as far as we've been led to believe in that scenario, wouldn't disaggregate, pardon the pun, wouldn't separate the uh, deliveries per site, so it would therefore be impossible to determine, without going into unnecessary calculation and, and time, how much of um, each tonnage was delivered to each site. But these firms are, um, sorry, these suppliers tend not to be vulnerable to late payment. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, they form part of a cohort of the supply side in the construction sector that really set their payment terms for the main contractor mm. to react to. Uh, and main contractors know that if they pay these kind of firms late uh, or, or, or partially, then the chances are they won't but get delivery the in the time. The point I was trying to job. make, or I'm trying to get round to anyway, is that if you have a project bank account set up for these three projects, mm -hmm. how do the, does that project bank account then know how much to pay out of that separate, each separate account to that one firm for? the bulk deliveries which were made over the three, if they're not separating them out, how does each bank account know what proportion they need to pay out of each project? I'm sorry, I don't you understand don't, no. the question. No. Um, say you were building three separate houses and it was three separate owners and they all wanted 10 tonne of sand each. The three separate owners wouldn't... Uh, Pay, wouldn't, wouldn't all get together and pay for 30 tonne of sand. They would want to pay 10 tonne each. So mm -hmm. if you've got three separate projects going on with three separate bank accounts and you're paying all suppliers and subcontractors, but you've got one supplier who refuses to separate it out into three separate invoices. Okay, in that context, um, each house would be subject to a separate contract and each contract would have its own project bank account. Uh, therefore, it would be incumbent upon the, the supplier, uh, if he wished to be paid in days rather than, than weeks, to actually disaggregate the uh, invoices so that were, they were reflective of deliveries per house or scaling up per project. Mm -hmm. but my point is that material suppliers tend not to be paid late and tend not to have their payments withheld, I'm given to understand. So therefore, they're not vulnerable to the same kinds of payment extensions and delays that other parts of the construction sector, particularly small subcontractors, uh, experience time, time and again. Right. My, my second point was um, if you have a, a contractor, say, councillor or others who's in the building trade, wins a contract, it's a, a new project bank account has to be set up with new signatories, one from contractor and one from the council. Is that correct? Yep. 
And then a second contractor wins a totally separate contract. You need to set up a separate account with a, with two signatories. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, Councillor Carruthers here wins another contract and he hasn't worked with the council for six months or eight months. Do you then have to set up another account or do you use the dormant account? I'm just um, trying to figure out how, yeah. how much administration and... It is quite difficult, actually, to set up bank accounts with proof of identity and all the rigmarole you've got to go through these days. How much administration is this taking on to, for all these separate contractors? OK, um, no, fair points. Um, what, we're doing in, what we've done in Scottish Government is that our banking services contract has recently been renewed and the successful bidder, RBS, uh, has been, as part of their bid process, was asked to... Uh, put together a proposal for providing corporate project bank accounts. So, in theory, Scottish Government will have one supplier for banking services that includes provision of corporate bank, uh, bank account services. Um, what the Council or any public body could do, and this would, I would recommend this would have to be well into the future, once it became a mature and experienced user of project bank accounts, it could set up a single account and then uh, award contracts, separate contracts, a reference number in respect of the overall project bank account and monies could be drawn down relative to each contract by that reference number. Therefore, that potentially could happen. I wouldn't recommend that if the Council was minded to consider project bank accounts that it went that far so soon. Uh, I would recommend gathered experience and then considered what you would want to do. But you're perfectly correct. Um, each public contract that Council awards that is deemed suitable for a project bank account, if the Council so wished, it would require a bank account to be set up. I would suggest that, uh, again, if you're minded to pursue this, you perhaps make inquiries with your corporate bankers to see if they operate project bank accounts. On their pilot projects, Barclays Bank uh, providing bank account services, RBS on, on others, uh, we understand, but we haven't had this confirmed, that uh, HSBC provide project bank account services. Uh, project bank accounts are very, very similar to escrow accounts. So escrow accounts are meat and drink to uh, the banking sector. Um, we would prefer project bank accounts to be set up on an internet-based internet platform, and Barclays have that. Um, they have a Barclays.net system, which, although it hasn't been designed, for project bank accounts shows great synergies with the sorts of um, processes that are required to effectively administer and manage a project bank account. And we'll be working with RBS as our restored corporate, corporate bankers in Scottish Government to look at their systems and processes for uh, taking forward project bank accounts. Councillor Crothers. Thanks. Uh, just on the back of what Colin was saying there, but it's slightly it's a tangent to the side. It's in regards to, to PBAs, will they have a, a positive or negative effect or any effect at all on the chance of monopolisation? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, PBAs, will they have any, any effect at all, either promoting or, or negating it against the chance of monopolisation, larger larger companies? Monopolising? Well, uh, so, Monopoli so will PBAs have an effect on whether or not larger firms monopolise yeah. They're winning with public contracts, is that? Aye, well, in a, in a sense, or even, I mean, what, what came to mind, sprung to my mind there when Colin was putting forward his thing, you've got large companies that have lots of subsidiary companies and they could be awarding smaller contracts to them mm -hmm. and then you have this whole circle. It's almost like a form of monopolisation. Mm -hmm. It's how does, is, <coughs> is that a, a chance that could really happen? That they could, rather as DLOs, they could set up a load of subsidiary companies? It, or can, just what effect, just wonder what your view is on that? Yeah, no, again, um, some research was done by, um, it was either OGC on the cusp of Cabinet Office or into the early days of the Cabinet Office. And they uncovered um, a compounded markups and hidden costs that were made to the public sector under the guise of the, the sort of thing that you're talking about. You know, um, subsidiaries of subsidiaries covered by a parent group. And effectively, the work, most of the work on site was being done by a single corporate entity under the guise of a variety of names that were all linked back through Companies House to a single entity. Now that exists at the moment. We 
again, it's early days. It's not a factor that we think that will be exacerbated by project bank accounts. In other words, we don't think that companies will organise themselves to the effect that they'll be um, awarding themselves or their subsidiaries' work. I, mean, I, I know, having worked in the sector on the contracting side, that uh, there is huge, huge competition within different cost centres of large contracting firms. And uh, although there's an incentive to retain as much of that wealth in the parent group as is possible, um, sometimes it doesn't happen and uh, markets are tested beyond the walls of the, the corporate entity. At this stage, I don't think that would be, that project bank accounts would exacerbate that situation. Uh, it exists currently. Uh, I think it remains to be seen the effect to which project bank accounts would have an effect. Do you think it could reduce it then? It's both sides of the scale. Do you think it could make it le less of a chance then of that happening? Frankly, it's not something that we've kind of looked at at this stage. It's probably something that uh, we have a limited amount of pilots and the, again, this is an evidence session, so I will be as honest as I possibly can. The firms that are involved in the pilots, even if they wished to restructure themselves uh, and, and form a, an internal supply chain, the extent to which they would do so based on participation in one or two pilot projects, I think would be limited. So it would be difficult to actually see us being able to gather evidence in that context. Um, again, that points to the overall point you're making, sir, I think, indicates whether or not uh, contractors would restructure themselves radically, purely to accommodate the loss of utility of another firm's money. I'm not so sure that would be something that would happen as a direct result of project bank accounts. There are more radical things at play. You might know, for example, that London Underground is seeking no longer to engage with main contractors and will be a construction manager itself and will directly employ subcontractors. Now, that's a direct intervention by a kind of quasi-public body that will change the structure of the market in that very, very narrow but very, very valuable subsector. We don't really see the equivalent happening in Scotland purely as a result of project bank accounts. Councillor Mayo. Thanks, Chair. I think Councillor Carruthers has covered part of what I was going to ask because I have a grave fear about our small to medium-sized businesses in, in going down this route um, because we, we ourselves as a council have obviously got to the stage where we've looked at payment and, and I think put now in place a payment system for firms that, that come to work, especially the small firms that come to work so, so that they're no left. And I really still believe, Councillor Crothers is saying, that there's an opportunity here for a big firm or big firms to get involved and by the time we find out that they have done a, a sort of deal where they're, they like paying themselves and their own subcontractors, that the, the, the companies in Dumfries and Galloway would really, really suffer and, and, and go to the wall quicker than if that system wasn't in place. Say, because we are a region generally of small to medium enterprise businesses. We do not have a lot of large business here. And I would be concerned that this system would actually go against what, we, what we've been trying to do with our small businesses to keep them employed and give them work. Mm -hmm. Um, and, okay, so in terms of um, the European threshold, which is currently £4.3 million, pounds, I think the regulations give the opportunity for public bodies to ask firms to identify their, the composition of their supply chain where it's possible to do so. So that would provide an opportunity, um, based on the legislation, to interrogate that particular aspect, that particular concern that, that you have. Um, now, far be it from me to say, but perhaps Council might wish to consider doing something similar in below threshold procurements. Uh, um, now, we know that the, Scot the Procurement Reform Scotland Bill is now an act as of last week. Um, I think there are provisions in there regarding regulated procurements over £2 million um, up to the 4.3 threshold that uh, could give rise to similar opportunities to interrogate the makeup of supply chain and to ascertain at that stage how a firm that's going to contract with yourselves as a council actually has composed its supply chain and whether it's a series of back-to-back -back arrangements with, with effectively in-house entities under the same parent group. And if that's the case, then clearly the council could take whatever action was, was possible in that context.
no further questions for Colin. That's that, Colin. Um, okay, thank you. We'll move on to the second part, which is the Public Contracts Scotland presentation. Password. Do you want to? Did you want to set up a, the internet? Uh, good morning. I'm Caroline Kenefe, and I work in the part of the Scottish Government that's involved with the procurement reform program. And I work in, it's a fancy title, but I'll tell you what it means. It's, it's a capability development and I'm a policy implementation officer. And in plain English, what that means is we're trying to make procurement better. We'll come up with ideas, we'll come up with plans and strategies. Somebody's got to actually go about and implement them and make them happen. So that's what I do and that's what my colleague Laurie Wilcox does. Uh, specifically, I deal with the Public Contracts Scotland website. And this came about um, back in 2007. Feedback from suppliers who wanted to supply to the public sector said, do you know what, it's a nightmare trying to find the opportunities in the first place. Um, supplying is a whole different ballgame, but if we actually knew where the opportunities were, that would be a big help. At the time, they were having to do things like looking trade magazines, look in local adverts, perhaps pay some private people to look for adverts for them in sites. So in response to that, the Scottish Government set up a website that the public sector would use to advertise their, their contract opportunities and that would be free for suppliers and that they could go and look at it. So that's all Public Contracts Web Scotland is. It's a website that gives suppliers free access to contract and more recently, subcontract opportunities relating to Scottish public sector. I like to call it the nearest thing the Scottish Government's ever going to get to setting up a dating agency. You've essentially got a lot of people on one side who want one thing, the buyers. You've got a lot of people on the other side who would like to meet that need, the suppliers, and we match it, just like match.com or whatever. So that's really all. It's not anything very sophisticated. How does it actually work? Whoops. I'll come on, Kate. You'll all have to look up there, that's gone blank. Essentially, buyers in the public sector, that's your procurement colleagues up the back here, when they identify a need, they go on and they advertise it on the site. They can also use the site to just ask for direct quick quotes for very low value things. So, for instance, if you were looking for £500 worth of photography, you're not going to advertise it to all and sundry. You would be inundated with responses. So, you can either do a general advert, or you can use it to ask for what we call a quick quote, which is a direct request to suppliers. More recently, we've been looking to get a wee bit more bang from our procurement buck. And basically, what we saw was an opportunity for advertising subcontract opportunities on the site as well. So within the Scottish Government, we have written into our large-scale contracts that the main contractor must advertise all subcontract opportunities on the Public Contract Scotland website as well. Suppliers can either then go on and just browse for opportunities without registering, without putting on any of your details, or you can actually be a wee bit smarter and you can use it again, like match.com, and you can go on and you can put on what we call a profile. So you can say, I'm um, um, Jeannie Bloggs and I'm a plumber, and I'm interested in plumbing opportunities only in mainland Scotland, not prepared to go to the islands, or you can say you're interested in supplying all of Scotland. You can put in whatever your profile is. What the system then does behind the scenes is when a buyer puts on an opportunity, it searches every supplier's profiles, and whatever suppliers match that, it'll automatically send them an email 
with a link to the opportunity so they can go straight in and look and see if they're interested. So only registered suppliers can do that. And it, what that does is it makes sure it gets them into a loop. They can record their interest and any further communications that the buyer puts out, maybe clarifications, it may be somebody's asked some questions and they've put answers on, you'll get copied into all of that as a supplier. So it means suppliers can basically go on the site, register their interest, and know that they don't have to keep going back and checking what's happening. They'll automatically get emails for any developments in relation to that project. So you can concentrate on getting your tender together, knowing that if anything changes, if deadlines are extended, anything like that, then you're automatically going to get notified. At the moment, there's three levels of opportunities that will go through the site. Is everyone familiar with the term audio? Does anyone not know what that means? Okay, so there will be audio notices on the site and there will be what we call website notices. That's for projects that aren't of the value of the audio thresholds. So they're just called website notices. And also the quick quote that I spoke about before where the buyer can go on and just directly pick some suppliers normally anywhere between three and five for your average project and just write out to them and ask for a quote. And that's why I've drawn a little line under that. That's because that's not advertised. You wouldn't, as a supplier with that profile, get notified of that unless the buyer had selected you. Just some uh, facts and figures as to the, the sort of traffic that goes through the system. It's been in existence since August 2008. And we've got 970 purchasing authorities, that's buying authorities, registered. Now, you might think there's not 970 public authorities in Scotland. Uh, two points on that. Number one, you would be surprised. Um, you've got all sorts of things, like the Seed Potato Commission that you've never heard of, except when you go to work on the Public Contract Scotland website. And we take quite a liberal view of what a public sector body is. Basically, if it's procuring under public sector procurement law or on behalf of public sector, we'll let them go in there so that the opportunities are getting as wide an audience as possible. Within those uh, buying organisations, we've got over 6,000 buyers. And we've also, since we introduced the subcontracting, got 26 prime contractors on there who are advertising subcontract opportunities only in relation to their public sector projects, though. So, they're not advertising willy-nilly all the projects. It's only in direct relation to a public sector contract that they have won, probably through the Public Contract Scotland website. Um, last week, we had almost 65,000 suppliers registered on it. So given the nature of what the public sector buys and given the nature of the supply sector within Scotland and the amount of suppliers who would want to or indeed be in the business of supplying to the public sector. That's a really, really strong critical mass that we've got there. We've got the vast majority of suppliers who are interested in supplying to the public sector. The sort of level of opportunities that come through, I won't read that out because you can see it for yourself. Suffice to say that that comes out at just over 1,100 opportunities a month. Now, at the moment, it's not mandatory for public sector bodies to use this contract to advertise their website. It's completely up to their own discretion. Um, the biggest users are obviously uh, local authorities, the NHS, colleges and universities, um, police and fire, and obviously central government. And um, we've got really good coverage within that. Once you get out to things like... Um, housing agencies, it's a wee bit more disparate in terms of their use. But the Public Procurement Reform Bill is going to include in it a requirement for all public bodies with a project of more than £50,000. So that could be over three years, it could be over four years, so that's quite a small public sector contract. They must advertise it on PCS. So this level of traffic will be due to go up once that becomes law, or even in advance of that, as organisations that aren't using it 
become aware of what's going to be required of them and they start to get their house in order, they're going to start to put, put more notices on Public Contract Scotland website. What the system also does is all OG notices, regardless of whether or not the organisation has put it on here, go on the journal, which is obviously where the word comes from, OG, if it's a word now. The system will go to OJU and scavenge every single Scottish notice. So whether or not uh, someone has put that on, you it will bring it in and put it on. So although it's not mandatory and you're not seeing every public sector opportunity, you are seeing every OJU opportunity within Scotland because the system either got it from OJU or it got it from the buyer. So all high value projects in Scotland are going through public contract Scotland. And just to bum our chaff a wee bit because we're really pleased with the subcontracting facility, just to give you an idea of the amount of business that, that something like that can actually bring to an economy. Uh, the fourth replacement crossing, um, we wrote into that contract that the, the primary contractors, which was a consortium of four people, had to advertise all their subcontract opportunities on PCS. And to date they've advertised 281 and 183 of them went to Scottish based suppliers. And it's not all um, the sort of subcontracts you think, you know, it's easy to think if you're building uh, a bridge that the subcontracts will be for things like steel and roads and, and building materials and things to do with building. Um, some of the first subcontracts that were awarded on the fourth replacement crossing um, were contracts that you, would, you maybe wouldn't have expected. They set up site offices, of course, for the workers, and very quickly you need those offices cleaned and you need the workers catered to. They need to be able to eat. So some of the first subcontracts that were awarded for the fourth replacement crossing were to a local catering company and to a cleaning company. So it's not always what, it's not always the subcontract opportunities that, that that you would immediately think of that flow out of that. So because we were successful with that, what we've now done with PCS, the Scottish government only has uh, the, the remit and authority to insist our contractors do that on their contracts, but to encourage the rest of the public sector, like um, the council, the NHS, all these kind of people. To think about doing that, um, once any buyer goes on and advertises any OJU contract, once they start to go through the process in PCS, a question is now automatically asking them, will you include a subcontract clause within your contract that will demand that the contractor advertises all subcontracts through PCS? If they say yes, we provide them with a legal phrase that has been cleared by our legals that will be used by us and that actually demands that. So it's sitting there, it's easy to use. Now whether or not that, that has been done in Dumfries and Galloway, I don't know, but it's certainly something to think about. It's something that if you want to take forward, happy to speak with you um, afterwards, or you can contact me later on through your procurement people. On the back of that, we get quite carried away with ourselves, we thought that's quite good, we like that, that's having the effect we want, and we thought we can also extend that to include community benefits. And community benefits it, it is a bit wider. It can be lots of things. Um, normally, it's been in relation to things like training, job opportunities, etc., etc. So we can write into our contracts, large-scale OGU contracts, and we have done things like this contract must provide training facilities for X amount of new entrants to the trade, X amount of local employment opportunities. So we automatically ask buyers now as well on large scale OG projects, do you want to include a community benefits clause? It's just to make them think about it, um, to at least bring it into their consciousness. Uh, if they say no, we ask them if they could give us a reason so that we can look at that and we can say, right, why do they not want to use uh, community benefits clauses? Might not have been appropriate, fair enough. Is there resistance? What? If they say yes, we can also, we're gathering information to look at what sort of community benefits they're asking for. As I say, nowadays, it's a given that procurement gets you the right product at the right place 
at the right time and at the, all that kind of stuff. We are looking for an awful lot more bang for our bucks, and increasingly in the public sector, and certainly from the Scottish Government, we're using procurement to drive local economic development and sustainability. And that can sound quite highfalutin, and you think, well, how is it they're actually doing it? Well, that's how. Through simple things like making your system force buyers to at least think about best practice where it could be appropriate. There's a selection of other features that are useful for suppliers um, on the system. Um, I'll let you read through them. Uh, basically, you can conduct the whole tender exercise through PCS. You can communicate back and forwards with the buyer. You can send your tender documents in. And we also provide regular bulletins about things that we might think will be of interest to suppliers. So things like the procurement reform bill having that new threshold of £50,000 and you must advertise in PCS, that would obviously be of interest to suppliers. We don't expect them to keep up to date on the progress of the reform bill through Parliament. We'll provide them with the information in a quick format and we regularly email things like that out to them. We've also recently, in response to suppliers, particularly suppliers within the construction sector who tend to work on long-term delivery projects, the feedback from them was, you know, it would be really good if the minute you knew you were planning something that affected your suppliers, we knew too. So, yeah, that sounded like common sense to us. So essentially what we've done now is we've put on the forward plans of all the centres of expertise. Does everyone know what the centres of expertise is? Does anyone not know what they are? Right, essentially what the, the, has been done in recent years was, um, years back for instance, uh, every council buys bin lorries. Well, all the 32 local authorities would go out and they would spend their time, their effort, their money and they would all negotiate and get bin lorries. And probably what happened was the Glasgow's and the Edinburgh's of this world that spent lots of money probably got cheaper bin lorries than you did because they could buy in bulk. Uh, a while back we looked at that and said, you know what, that doesn't make sense. What we should have is central bodies for each sector who will procure on behalf of the sector the things that everyone in that sector buys. So things like bin lorries. So there will be a centre of expertise for local authorities, and that's called Scotland Excel. There's one for the NHS that will procure things like hospital beds, drugs, all the kind of things that are used by all the health sector, but only by the health sector. And that was to be much more efficient in terms of the manpower that was spent procuring, and also you can get much better deals, obviously, when you're negotiating for the bin lorries for Scotland PLC as opposed to the bin lorries for Dumfries and Galloway Council. So that's really, so they tend to do the large scale sectoral projects. So we've got their forward plans on there for suppliers to see. And it's divided up into here's our existing contracts and when they end. Here's what we know we will definitely procure within the next two to three years. And here's a bit of blue sky stuff as well. These are things we might procure, we might not. Um, and it's just to give suppliers a heads up. What we're currently working on to enhance that and what will be required by the bill is that every public sector organisation will be required to now produce a publicly facing contract register. So every public sector organisation, the council, will have to now produce by the time the bill comes in, a publicly facing contract register. So every single contract that the, the council either lets for themselves or uses from one of the COEs, they will have to have that clearly visible to anyone that wants to know what, what contracts the Dumfries and Galloway Council use. They'll have to do that. Now, they can host it on their own website. They can host it anywhere they like. But we thought, well, you know, here's another opportunity. We've got the information within PCS. We've got the functionality we could produce a solution to that for the public sector. So what we're going to do, and it's currently in development, we're hoping to release it by November, December, is we will produce contract registers for every single organisation that's on PCS, and that will be viewable to suppliers. So they can look and see, you know, I'm interested in XYZ, I want to see what contracts are coming up within the next year, two years. I'm going to get and look at everyone's contract register and see have they got a current contract? When's it due to end? 
when are they likely to be tender? So it is to allow suppliers, especially as I say, ones who work on longer term projects, to plan out their business, give them, help them to do things like three and four and five year plans. And that was, as I say, direct feedback from our uh, negotiations and all our talking with uh, the supply base. And we tend to use um, things like the Federation of Small Businesses, Chambers of Commerce, um, all these representative bodies. We regularly meet with them and we regularly have stakeholder engagement. And it's largely them that drives all the supplier developments. We are not sitting there in an ivory tower knowing what, what the, the issues are for suppliers. We have to get it direct from the horse's mouth and we develop this, what we think and hope are the solutions in tandem with them. So that's really, that's really for when I'm talking to suppliers, but I know some of you are suppliers and for the ones of you that are, if you're not in PCS, go straight home and register and uh, keep your profile up to date, check your emails regularly and record your interest. That's really uh, all I want to say about uh, the system itself. Um, anyone got any questions they would like to ask about it? I suppose um, the first one would be, we have a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises down here. How do we make sure as a council that they know about you? So that they can right. go on and register, right. and what sort of size of, I think it was sixty-five thousand suppliers. I think it was. You know, are they one-man bands up to corporate? They are everything. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of the sort of value that can go through, um, the lowest quick quote that that we're aware of that has been awarded in the system was for under four hundred pounds, right up to multi-million pounds. The fourth road crossing. So there's business on there for everybody at everybody's level. There's a few ways, I guess, um, that I would say to you. I regularly go on and, and, and help out in man stands at Meet the Buyer events, so happy to come along to any of them. Also on their website, you know, whatever you think a supplier is likely to go, if it's, say a supplier comes on and goes, looking for business with Dumfries and Galloway, um, make sure that you have links to the Public Contract Scotland website. Have a clear policy, first and foremost, on your use of public contracts website. Make sure that you actually do mandate its use within the council, and then you can clearly say to anybody that contacts you, as we can in the Scottish Government, and this saves your procurement people a huge amount of time as well, dealing with su suppliers that are just cold calling. We advertise everything on the website. If you're looking for any business, the best way you can go about that to get the business from this council is to register on the site, get a profile, and you will automatically receive email alerts. We will also shortly have a contract register on the site, which will tell you years in advance when our contracts are likely to come up. So not only is it good for the supplier, but it's good for your procurement department who probably do have to deal with cold calling suppliers. Hello, I've got this product, I'd like to come and show you, I'd like to do all that kind of stuff. So it, everybody knows where the shop is, when it's opened, how it's opened, nobody's mixed up and they, and they know what they can buy there. It's, it's the easiest way, it saves us a huge amount of time in the Scottish Government. It also provides you, should you ever need it, with a very clear audit trail for anything that's ever happened. Um, so if a supplier ever comes to you and says, you never told me about that opportunity, which happens, uh, we can audit the system, we can produce the email alert they got, all those kind of things. It's, it's, it's essentially without, you know, a, I'm not just saying this because obviously I deal with the system, it's one of the most intuitive, does what it says it does in the tin system that you could get. Um, it doesn't need any special training to operate. If you've ever bought anything off Amazon or eBay, it's as intuitive as that. Uh, it's, we've never had any issues with suppliers not knowing how to use it. Um, and feedback we get is that suppliers really do like it. It saves them a huge amount of time and effort trawling about looking for, or, for opportunities. Um, obviously, as I say, if you can get the council to commit to fully using PCS, and making sure that any arm's length organisations as well uses them. You can honestly put your hand in your heart and say to all your suppliers, everything goes through there. That's where you will see any opportunity to sell to the council. And you mentioned about was it 
community community benefits, benefits. Yep. if we put in a contract that we would like to see say 80 percent of the contract going locally um how do you manage to make sure that happens um i'm thinking of the fact that say ian was the main contract and he lives in annandale and estale the contracts for this dale he then subcontracts to me and i subcontract back to jane who's stuart Ray. <laughs> and all the work goes through stuart Ray rather than through this how do you make sure that that doesn't happen because it's been brought up by a couple of people at various things that although you get this 80 percent local all you need to do is have a middleman who everything goes through and actually he can subcontract out so how do you make sure that doesn't happen right the first thing i have to say um or colin will have a heart attack is that uh, it's illegal under public sector procurement uh, legislation from europe to discriminate and say you want the business to go anywhere you can't even say i want it to go in scotland uh, you cannot discriminate you have to treat all suppliers um, equally regardless of location so i've said that quite clearly the next thing i would say just on that why do we get advised otherwise by the likes of uh, the hub they say you can put in your contract so much of it can go locally. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, the, the Scottish Futures Trust hub, South West Hub and other hubs, um, we are given to understand that the, the hubs aren't governed by public procurement legis legislation. So they're separate entities, separate from that legislation. So they're not subject to those same requirements, although we do understand that uh, the hubs are seeking to work within broad parameters that are equivalent to the um, aspects of, of that legislation. They do have flexibility and they, they can make certain targets in terms of their delivery and their broader social benefits. Um, they can bring them to the fore more clearly in ways that public procurement legislation, as Carolyn quite rightly says, would deem illegal. No, no. The, the other thing I was going to say, and perhaps maybe not so much in construction, is um, there can be scope for, shall we say, requirements of the contract that would make it such that only a local supplier could deliver that. That's not illegal. So, for instance, um, we always give a really obvious example, and that's all I'm prepared to give, especially when I'm on record. Um, you can say we want 10 tonnes of fruit a week, and the fruit must have been picked within 20 minutes of getting on our plate. Clearly, no one more than 20 minutes away could provide you with the fruit. So you, you, can, you can be creative, shall we say, and, but you have to be legal. So you can't come out right and say, we only want Scottish suppliers. Um, but you can come up with terms and conditions that are likely to favour those suppliers. Councillor Maitland. Um, Ivor, you touched on it really uh, yourself about the tensions between what we want to achieve with our buying power for our local businesses and what we want to achieve with respect to the public pound buying effectively. Um, Sorry, could I just make myself absolutely clear that that only applies to things audio and above, the audio regulations. So that's for the, just to be clear on that. Well, if I could come on, because that was my next point, which was, um, you know, what percentage of public sector procurement do you really think is actually up on that website? Um, I, I mean, I, w I would right. suggest to you that it's quite difficult to know and I would suggest to you it's also quite possible for councils to have things which are being bought which are not up on that website. Absolutely, absolutely. Not everything goes through that, but whether or not it's on that website, it's bound by the European legislation. So they will be following the same processes, but just advertising the opportunities somewhere else, um, perhaps on their own website, perhaps continuing to advertise it in the local press, trade journals, etc etc so yes absolutely 
And what the, the, the EU regulation does says it says you must advertise sufficiently to get uh, to be to be not discriminating against people who wouldn't see for so for instance you couldn't just advertise I come from a town called very small town called or village even called Skelmerley. You couldn't just advertise it in the monthly Skelmerley news. So you know, but you, you you can you know how how you advertise is still a matter of choice for a public body. The vast majority choose this because it's um, you know fine you've met your requirements if you put it on that. Um, but yes, we put our hand up and say you know but we're not seeing absolutely everything, but we are seeing the vast majority. The very vast majority. And the, the, what this system also does is the buyer has to go in and put on a contract award. And as a supplier, if you were registered in that area of interest, you would see that too. But it also sends that contract award information to the system. Laurie's going to talk to you about a bit so that councils can use that to monitor their own contract spend. Because one of the other complaints that we got from suppliers uh, was that um, do you know what, um, I, I bid when I went through all the processes and I got a lovely public sector contract and you told me it was going to be worth half a million and do you know what, I got £60,000 worth of business out of that. And that's not normally because the organisation doesn't want to spend it, it's because sometimes it can be hard to police if you're a very large organisation and make sure everyone buys on contract. So we needed to be able to monitor not only the contracts that we were awarding, but where people, when it came to actually ordering, if you were a stationary, for instance, supplier, when it came to somebody in an office in Ochter Mukti ordering the blue pen, where they ordering it off on, on or off contract, or were they running out and buying a blue pen, whatever. So the system, Laurie, will talk to you about uh, the public contract Scotland passes all contract award information to that so that we can monitor on contract spend and make sure that when we do award contracts, that you're actually getting the value of the contract you expected. So we can get a fair idea of how much goes through PCS in terms of the volume, because Laurie's system then also takes all the spend from the councils at year end and looks at the two, basically. So it looks at what has the council spent, um, what are all the contracts. Um, so we have a fair idea, and we have got about 60 to 70 percent coverage. But as I say, we're hoping that should rise because the reform bill is going to make it um, mandatory for any projects over £50,000. As I say, most projects that you're going to start going out and advertising all that for are over two to three years. So that's, that, that's, that's, that can sound big to a small company, £50,000. But if that's over three years, it's not that, that big a project and it might be within... Uh, their capability to deliver that level of business on a year-by-year -year basis. Councillor Crothers. Thanks, Chairman. I think probably my question has been answered primarily, but there was something I picked up on in regards to just wonder how we communications across departments. We've got your project bank accounts and community benefits was mentioned. The Fries and Garlic, because the, the, the raft of wind farms that were here, community benefits, one of the first things that pops into mind is is the community benefit that comes through that. We just, there's just been new Scottish advice, or guidance. Uh, we, we were looking at a particular scenario where we, we'd have a region, socio, region wide socioeconomic fund where 50% of the community benefit come out of that and the council would then look after that and control it and help it get, it, get into the community, uh, the local communities or even the wider region of Dumfries and Galloway. The guidance goes completely against that. Says that in fact, as a council, you can't really do that. You, you need to rethink what your facts, what your position is, and that would apply to all local authorities and, and plan authorities across Scotland. So what I'm thinking is project bank accounts, because what there's a risk to happen in the future, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of there is a, a clear line here we're heading for, is that in as the, the community benefit money starts coming out of Fries and Galloway, it's got to be easy to spend at the beginning. After seven, eight, nine, ten years and it'll be tied in for 25 years, remember, uh, it's got to be more difficult because a lot of projects will be built out so the, this money will start to accumulate as it maybe doesn't get spent. Now, one of the risks to, to Dumfries and Galloway at that, at that point, through the financial risks, I would say, is that the developer has the right to say, if it's not being spent, I'll take that back. Thanks very much. Project matter come. To me, there's a clear correlation between the two. Again, that money, really, I would have thought for a, a community benefit, and this is where, where I'm kind of thinking when, when I tied up the two. Again, surely you think that 
community benefit and the Priest and Valley of Arena were else in Scotland. If that level of funds, and it'll be millions of pounds will get paid into the Priest and Valley through different organisations. If it was going into project bank accounts, then it'd be locked in. It'd be there in perpetuity until such time as it was spent. Uh, as it stands at the moment, there's a risk that after, if it doesn't get spent after eight, nine, ten years and they're on, that money could be clawed back and never seen that the Priest and Galloway would never see that community benefit. I wonder if there's been any discussions at all between departments or, or Scottish Government in regards to that. Um, I'm obviously not aware of, of the fund that, that you're talking about. I mean, in terms of PCS, the community benefits that we're talking about tend to be in relation to uh, a supplier providing training opportunities and it's not actual money. It's it's as part of, so for instance, um, there was a new Scottish crime campus uh, built out at Gart Kosh, um, and it's not what I thought it sounded like. It's not where you go to learn to be a criminal. It's where actually the good guys go and they're all getting together to try and fight serious organised crime. So there's a big crime campus built. We wrote into our contract, for instance, obviously it was going to be a huge uh, construction project that they must deliver X amount of training opportunities for new entrants to various trades. They had to deliver X amount of uh, local employment opportunities. And by that, it means, uh, you know, the employment opportunities were local, not necessarily where Jeannie came from. Um, so it, it's things like that. It's, it's saying, how can we make this, this project, which would probably have created some of these things anyway, how do we harness that? How do we control it? And how do we get it to impact an economic development in the area that it's been built in? So it's not, it's, it's no cash or anything like that. But in terms of the fund that, that you're talking about, I think you would obviously have to go back to the, the, the people who, who deal with that. Um, I'm not, I'm not aware of it, I'm afraid. That's fine. I, mean, I understood. I thought that was the kind of benefits. It was just a the wee bit of a tangent. I thought there might have been links. I thought no, not at all. Sure. Might have been said in regards to maybe Collins, but I think uh, happy to come in here if that's. Are we on? Yeah. Um, yeah. The the pilot projects uh, at the moment, by their very nature, are limited in number, and they're focused purely on the building side of the overall construction, one civil engineering project, which uh, incidentally is in the first minister's constituency. So no pressure there. Um, you mentioned a 25-year term in respect of developers' interest in wind farms. To put it in simple terms, it's that the, there'll be a £5,000 per megawatt generated. In sim yeah. I'm only referring to uh, wind farms in, in the Fries and Galloway. Pretty much that's what will be tied into, so they'll pay X amount of money into a fund. There's a real risk there that after a few years, that money will be more difficult to spend because it'll, it'll be spent on a lot of local projects. It'll be more difficult to spend. I think, as far as I'm aware, legally, if it's not being spent, the developer can say, well, in fact, you're not spending that. We'll take it back, thanks very much. There's a real chance of being lost, uh, losing that money to Dumfries and Galloway. So therefore, if it, that money was being paid into like, a project bank account, it's a bit of a, 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 of a tangent here, but it, it would secure that money for, for Dumfries and Galloway in perpetuity, where, as, as it stands at, at the moment, there's a risk that we could lose a lot of that money. I mentioned earlier that project bank accounts are part of the overall stable of escrow, so it could well be there's facility potential for the council to investigate the use of an escrow account to protect the, the, the money that you're uh, talking about, sir. Uh, I must admit, I'm not aware, like Caroline, of the actual detail um, of the scenario you described, but if it's about protecting money that otherwise would be lost to the council, um, far be it for me to suggest, but perhaps there are ways out with of a what we would call a standard project bank account that can be deployed by the council to protect its fiduciary interest, interest in the benefits derived from um, wind farm developments. Councillor Mayo. Thanks, dear. I, mean, I think in Dumfries and Gala we pride ourselves on that we try and get best value from a contract which is not always finance. From what I'm hearing, I'm concerned that what we may end up with is just a contract being awarded on price and what is not actually best value for the people of this region. How, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Is that addressed to? <laughs> is that addressed to? In, in the context of Carolyn? <laughs> um, I, I don't think there's any correlation that we can see between a migration to price only based assessments and the introduction potentially of project bank accounts. Um, it would depend on the European procedure for above threshold procurements that the Council adopted to 
um, deliver a, a, certainly a construction project. Um, we would tend to recommend a movement away from, if they still exist, price only assessments. Um, I, I don't know, honestly, I don't know what the Council's policies, policy is in these areas, but Scottish Government um, does not advocate for its own purposes the use of price only assessment. Um, we, we do require a quality based input to the overall tender assessment process, otherwise you can't be assured you're getting the best of the tenderer's intellectual capacity to help you deliver the solution that you require. Yeah, th th thanks for that, Chair. Th there's one other, I think I have the word, two words Scotland Excel mentioned by the lady. I just wonder if we could have a more detail on Scotland Excel and what exactly it does. Right. Uh, it, its official title, I think, is it's a centre of, of procurement expertise. And what it does is it procures uh, goods on behalf of all the local authorities in Scotland. Um, so the sort of uh, goods that only local authorities buy, but all local authorities buy. And what they do is they set up framework agreements usually with um, a range of suppliers on that. And local authorities can either choose to buy off that framework, or if they don't want to, they can go out and do their own contracts for whatever it was that goods, the goods or services were. So essentially what it does is it provides, if you like, a central procurement facility for the public, eh, for the Scottish local authorities, but it's not mandatory that your local authority buy from it and they can pick and choose. They could say, right, well, we'll use your contract for bin lorries, but we're not using the one for that. So it's there if, if you want to use it, if you feel it's a good deal, um, but you don't have to use their contracts. Does it have a, an audit remit for councils on procurement? Um, what, what it does do, is, it's not an audit in terms of a formal or legal audit, but as part of the procurement reform programme, um, every, org, every main organisation in the public sector, not all those 970 that you saw, gets a procurement capability assessment done every year. And that looks like a wide range of procurement, basically, and just says, you know, it, it sort of maps you against best practices at where and says, how are you doing? And where are areas where you need to improve? So the centres of expertise in each area go out and carry them out for their, uh, the people within their sector. So Scotland Excel will be involved in the procurement capability assessment but that's not a legal audit um, in terms of, of what you might mean by an audit. Thank you. Well, I think that last one clarified a few points because we have used in the past qualitative as well as quantitative uh, indicators in our procurement, so that's good. Now, Laurie, I think you're going to give us a small demonstration on another part of the system. Right, well, good, after, good afternoon. Um, my name's Laurie Wilcox. I'm a Procurement Capability Development Officer. Um, I work with Caroline. And rather than do a, a presentation for you, what I'd like to do is just give you a demonstration on some functionality which is available to 120 organisations, public sector buying organisations, across the whole of Scotland. And it's a way of looking at their spend, how it's classified, and then it's broken down into various reports. So hopefully, fingers crossed, if the technology works, we'll get some pretty pictures come up. Um, if it all goes wrong, just like my country, I'll be going home today with my tail between my legs. So what happens with, um, with Spikes Gavel 
is every year they take accounts payable data, they're passed it by your accounts payable section, by your finance team, they then analyze it and they classify it. When they classify it, what they do is they look at the suppliers that have been put on your accounts payable system and they have a look and they say, right, what size is that supplier? Do we know that? If not, we'll go out to a um, company's house, we'll go to Experian, we'll try and find out some more detail and attach that to the, the, the supplier's detail. Whereabouts are they registered? Have they got an address with a postcode? Yes, they have. In that case, we'll have a look and see where they are. So the sort of things you're seeing here are spend supplies, spend somewhere where the supplier size is known. Now, at the moment, I'm actually logged on as um, Dundee City because there's something else I'd like to show you regarding Grow Local in just a couple of minutes. But it shows you how their spend is broken up, how much they spend with large companies, how much with small companies, and with medium. What I can do to make this more relevant to yourselves is I'll change the data set and we'll put in Dumfries and Gallery's last um, data drop, which was in 12.13. There we go, Dunphys and Gallery data. So I apply that, and this will then um, work its magic. Things to bear in mind when you look at this data and how it's classified is it's, it's size there where the supplier size is known. As you've covered in some of the um, previous deliberations, a lot of suppliers are one-man bands. They're micros. Therefore, they normally haven't registered on company's house. Therefore, they haven't normally registered with a lot of other organizations. So they're not being classified because we don't know the size of them. We asked our economists to do some, some data analysis, and we gave them a, a, a data set. They came back and said, yes, out of Scotland's spend of around um, last, last year, about £10 billion, over a billion wasn't classified for size. But they thought that at least 90% of that was going to be spent with micro-organizations. <coughs> Because all the big guys, they're there. That we catch their spend very easily because they're being monitored constantly. Where we're not catching them, we can make a generalized um, and educated guess they're going to be small, small suppliers. So you see something similar to that. So how can that be used? Well, the whole point of the hub being invented and developed was to be worked by commodity managers. So when they want to go out and purchase a, a commodity, they can run reports, they can see who you spend with already underneath that commodity. Um, they can see who else is there and then make their decision from, from that. So for Dumfries and Galloway, if we have a look here, what do you spend um, most of your, your procurement spend on? Now, I would point out this is only procurement spend. We strip out all grants and payments, worthy calls payments, etc. We just look at what you spent in areas where we consider it to be procurement um, influenced. So for Dunfries and Gallery there, not surprisingly, because it fits in with the council, um, the way the councils all look, social and community care is at the top, construction is second. Then you've got facilities management, environmental services, etc., and it goes down that. You can have these reports produced for you uh, at any time Normally at the end of the financial year, certainly for myself, I have to produce this on behalf of SG and then pass it back to, um, back to answer parliamentary questions and freedom of information requests. So you can see that there. What you can also do with this is it allows you to actually drill down to see if there's anything further down. So we've got spend summary at the top there, social community care. We can actually go and drill it down. This is using ProClass to actually classify the supplier. We can actually go down three levels. So rather than just being construction, you can break it down to being building works. So the Pro Class 3, just for a little long here. So we're now looking at facilities and management services, other. It's looked at care services there, children with disabilities, social care, adult. So we can break it down to those levels. That's where the commodity teams can work, can look at that, see who the suppliers are and then do their analysis before they then put the next contract out. One of the things that is quite useful, um, has been used by a number of, um, of bodies as well, is they look at risk assessment. 
So supply is at risk. Now what this does, it looks at the suppliers that you deal with within Dumfries and Galloway and says how much do you spend with them and if we were to pull that spend away from you, would they be at risk? So we can then classify that um, down in different levels. So there we're actually seeing it's a very small at-risk um, area. However, if we were to then add another four or five councils to this um, analysis, you might find that at-risk area starts to build. Because whilst they might not have a massive amount from this council, it could be a lot of other councils deal with them as well. And when you accumulate all that spend, the risk then increases. Again, this can affect how your guys go out and do their, their um, procurements. One thing they can do is to make sure that anyone who's at, the, at risk there is at least aware of the opportunity coming up, to make sure they, they know it's going to be there. As Caroline said, Public Contract Scotland is the ideal way of doing that, especially for the, larger, um, for, 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 the, for the larger projects. If it's a small project and it's under EU threshold, this is where we can use quick quote facility. We can actually say, you can invite your, your five local suppliers. And out of those five local suppliers, you can make sure maybe three of them are SMEs. It's entirely up to your procurement department how they do that. But they've got the ability there to do that. And because it's below threshold, and it's a quick quote, direct invitation to them, and you are still running a competition, you're not then breaching um, the law. So this is what we're seeing here. So that is a very, very quick look through. The other thing we can do here, we can actually see how much we spend by region. Again, we start seeing with different councils, different profiles. As we're seeing here at the bottom, the biggest amount of spend is companies who've registered themselves in Strath Strathclyde, Glasgow and Strathclyde area. Probably good for yourselves, Next highest spend is with companies who are Scotland South. What you're also able to do with this is you can actually look at the data and see who the suppliers are that you've been spending with. So we can then break that down. You could then find out all the Scotland South suppliers and put that into a spreadsheet. So we can get down to the actual, the, the actual data being individual suppliers. To show you what that looks like, just have a quick look here. This will break down the spend that you've got and who's it with. So E4, D and G projects at the top. Then you've got Shanks, Dumfries and Galloway, Cable and Wireless. And we go down a list. I can then click on the button here and export that to Excel. You can then filter that to look at all those which are just of relevance to yourselves. The one thing we found when we were looking at this is how much of an eye-opener it can be. Whilst it looks as though you spend a lot with big companies, when you start seeing what they supply, and it's things like utilities, or it could be public transport, you can see why they actually twist the way the figures look. So it looks as though you spent a load with them, and not so much with the smaller medium guys, but in fact, if you were to strip out utilities and strip out those areas which are not really lending themselves to smaller medium enterprises, you can then start finding out where the opportunity is to spend that money with, it, with the smaller ones. So that is a really, really quick run through on this. But what I'd like to show you is something called Grow Local. Now again, I'll have to change to become Dundee City Council because they kindly enough allowed me to, to use their login for this. And Grow Local, what it is, is something to try and improve how you spend your money locally. So here we have opportunity analysis. It crops up. Target categories. This one has been classified by the Thompson category. And it will run now. Oh, sorry, that's just a data set being selected. The way Spikes Governors work with this is they've taken the spend that you've had over the year. So this is, this is um, Dundee City Council's 12-13 spend. They've looked at the categories 
looked at what's, um, what your spend is, but then they've also looked to see other companies and suppliers which were available that could have been used within your local area. So what we're looking at at the top here is civil engineers. For Dundee City Council, they have no spend whatsoever with any civil engineer that is registered within Dundee City Council's um, boundary. Its sub-region is Dundee, Angus, Perth and Kinross. So we can go out there and we can then monitor it there. And then you can go further out and see spend in the government region. And that has been expanded to include Fife in this case. So you can see what's, what's available and what, what, what has been spent and what hasn't. Now, the first thing we expect for the procurement people to do is to look at that. They can see where there's opportunities. We don't spend locally. But they want to know how many people have we got in our area that we can spend with. And it comes back, and basically for them, total vendors they use is four, but vendors in the government region is only one. Well, they can start looking in the directory and start saying, right, who do we actually spend with? So when we're looking through this, this allows your procurement team to look and see who is possibly a potential supplier. Why haven't we invited them before? Are they in the wrong category? Or is there a reason why not? When we worked with Dundee, one of the first things they did, they looked at it and said, ah, that'll be Jimmy's mechanics around the corner. He couldn't possibly do our contracts. That's why we haven't worked with him. So local knowledge kicked in straight away. They knew who they were, who they were dealing with because they had a list of suppliers in the directory that they could potentially use. But they did notice, notice a couple they could have done. So immediately they wrote them down and said, we'll make sure they're invited to future um, opportunities. Also, it gave them the opportunity to pick up the phone and say, we're having a meet the supplier event. Please come along. This doesn't just work, though, with your procurement folk. This is really going to be used by your economic development advisors, the guys in the council who are trying to develop business locally. They can take this, they can run these reports, and they can see how, you know, how they can actually progress this. It could be, there's absolutely, there's no chance to spend there, there are no suppliers, and it flags it up as being red. And when you flick through, that's, the way Spikes have done it, it's, it's different colour categories, so it says it's red. It could potentially be red because you actually haven't got anyone in that category within your council area. So an economic development advisor could then say, why not? Why haven't we got up there? Can we not encourage companies that deal with that to come and work with us in our region and have an opportunity to spend with them. Where we are with this at the moment is it's a pilot. The pilot involves the three Tayside councils, three Ayrshire and two from Lanarkshire. So I had funding to do eight councils to begin with. They're nearly six months into the, into the pilot. Mixed results so far. Some have come back and said we've already got two or three new suppliers in place. Others have held their hands up and quite honestly said, we haven't looked at this data in any detail because we just haven't got the resources at the moment, but we will do. I'm reviewing it every quarter with them to go through to see how that's working and can they improve on it. And when we've finished the pilot after a year, the decision will then have to be made. Will Scottish Government, like it does for the rest of the hub here, which you've seen on the spend analysis, will they fund that? Or will we have to work jointly with yourselves and other organisations and say, who would like to use this? Grow Local lends itself mainly to local authorities, to be perfectly honest, because that's where, though, that, that's, that's where it's, more, it's, it's most useful. And that's where the biggest spend locally always comes from. It's local authorities. Central government, no, we don't deal with, with that sort of area. And also, what is local for central government? I come from Glasgow, Colin and Callum from Edinburgh. So which would you put down as being a, a local supplier? So we're slightly different to that. So... That gives you a, a flavour of what we, can, or what, what we are trying to do and what we have done. As Caroline said, this is what comes out of the other end of the system. PCS, when you put an award through, award a contract, it builds a contract register. That contract register is soon to be held back on PCS. But it also lets you see who your suppliers are. And you look through at the suppliers and you find out, have we got a contract with them? And if we're spending millions and there's no contract in place, why have we done that? Let's go and put a contract in place and, and try and, and get our spend back on track 
and then we can, we can actually mon monitor it and manage it better. So, as I say, as a very, very quick run through, I do apologize for just sliding through it, but if you've got any questions. Councillor Prentice. Thanks, Chair. It's maybe, it's maybe actually a question for the whole. I was quite interested <coughs> when, you, when you were talking about the civil engineers in Dundee, you know, why don't we go out and ask these people, you know, if they want to, to you know, put in a, a place for various jobs. An oft heard thing out in the big bad world out there with, with civil engineers and various other professional people is, is that uh, are not interested in, in the, doing a quote for the council's books. There's that many hoops to jump through. There's that much rigmarole. There's this, there's that. And we do this and we do that. And it sometimes can take up to a year before things are finally settled because of various rules and regulations that councils have. And this is a very often quoted thing from, from professional people out in the bad world. I was just wondering what your reaction to that is. I would say that when we've done Meet the Buyer events, that's exactly the same sort of reaction you do get from a large number of suppliers. Not necessarily, a, not a massive number, but there still are a large number that say, I don't want to deal with the public sector because it's too difficult to deal with them. I don't understand the processes. And that is why PCS allows them to register so that they get notified. It allows them to be invited directly so they don't have to jump through those hoops. What they'll have to do then is put their bid in and meet the um, requirements of the tender and, and break it down that way. And the Meet the Buyer events seem to be a really useful way of actually meeting suppliers face to face, look them in the eye and tell them, what are you doing to try and make their life easier? Because that is partly why we've put a lot of these tools together. Council Maitland. Well, it goes back to the previous question um, with respect to the, the website. Um, I mean, I presume that this is only as good as the information that's on it. So if you haven't had a contract go through the website, it doesn't appear there. Now, I do understand that you're trying to match up the actual spend in the council to what is um, uh, you know, disaggregated there. So you, you get the comparison. I presume that that's the tool that can be used. Um, I would like to know um, if you've got any information as to what you're discovering about how much goes through, whether the 60 to 70 percent which you think goes through matches up with what the council analysis, the individual councils go, whether that's the case. Um, how public is this information? You know, can anybody use it? Um, we talked about how complete. and. Do you have a sort of toolkit? Because, I mean, I think this is really interesting, but I think it's not only interesting for us as elected members. I think it's also interested, interesting for um, businesses out there. Absolutely. Um, it isn't publicly facing. You have to register, and part of the reason for that is because the information was whether it's going to be classed as being commercial in confidence. However, what Spike Scavell have actually done is they've actually called, they've got something called Spotlight on Spend, and that allows you to publish the information publicly. That's been done by, I think it's East Ayrshire Council, Argyll and Butte, and I think it might have been one of the Renfrew Shears. They published that, and it has details about the council setup. It says who the members are, how much they spend, how many households in the council, in the council region, and, and some more sort of pertinent information. It then, when you click on the spend site, shows you classifications just as we're seeing here if we look down there civil engineers but but it allows you to drill through and then see finally who the suppliers are so they've made that publicly facing otherwise the access that the, the information has to be um, achieved really by an FOI what we found when we, when we put this together to do the the spotlight on spend was the the initial reaction from a number of um, bodies was no chance because that is just going to drown us in all these inquiries. What they found out it subsequently was by pu publishing the information in a public manner, when you get an FOI saying how much do you spend on construction, your answer is I refer you to our Spotlight and Spend website where it is all broken down for you. And therefore they killed the FOIs off because they were publi publicly publishing the information. It also takes away I think some perception you're trying to hide who your suppliers are as a council. 
just in case people have got the, the wrong, you know, wrong attitude towards where the spend's going. So that was, uh, that was one, one way we, we dealt with that. I'm sorry, I'm thinking what the rest of the question was. was that, does that answer it? I, I, I think you actually really have. Um, it's availability and how public it is. Um, and is it going to be rolled out? I'm not completely clear. You've got the information about Dumfries and Gallery, but you're talking about pilots, and I'm not, I don't quite understand. Um, the, the, the contract register here, we, 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 you mentioned that earlier. It is actually it's, it is, um, populated when you put an award through Public Contract Scotland, but you also populate it yourself with the procurement folk within the council. They can load up. If they suddenly find that an area has been putting their own contracts through, they can take them, put them into a spreadsheet, Spike Scaffell then take it and upload it on their behalf. So you can cover the, the spend, or not the spend, the contracts which did not go through Public Contract Scotland. Using Spotlight on Spend would be a decision for the council to make. The, it's there to be published. I believe, please don't quote me, but it's around the £1,500 mark to have that data published publicly, if that's a, the route you want to go down. But again, uh, Spikes Gavell can deal with yourselves directly on that. That isn't something that's been done by S the Scottish Government. We had a look at it. We helped the initial um, early adopters try, but since then, it's gone reasonably quiet. But however, with the, um, everyone looking at transparency and openness, I personally think it's something which has benefited those who've actually dipped their toe in the water. Councillor Wiper. Thank you, Chair. Um, that, that, that's a great idea. I think the more the people get access to information, the better um, in, in all aspects of, of council and government. I'm just very curious, and I, I might have picked it up wrong because it wasn't on the screen for very long, but when you, when you put up the figures where um, Glasgow and Strathclyde was the top spender and then South of Scotland came second, Edinburgh and Lothians was a way up the top. Is there, is it, are they not publishing their data? Because it looked as if we were spending ten times more in the south than Edinburgh and Lothian were. Is it? No, what the was what it? the actual graph was, was showing you was how much of your spend out of the hundred percent in Dumfries and Galloway was with suppliers who registered either, you know, in Strathclyde was the biggest. Then it's a the south. It means that your spend with companies who've registered within. Edinburgh and the Lothian region was just lower. So it wasn't, it wasn't saying um, the other way around that, no, that they haven't published their data. Edinburgh City Council published their data, as do all the, all the councils. They, they all use this, um, this tool to have their data published because that allows... Yep. Councillor Crothers. Just could you show me on the screen just how far you can draw down? How would you down? Just yeah. how far, that, as far as you can go, just to see, I just want to see what level of information you can, you can actually get out of it. If we just have a, a quick look here, what I'm going to do is line item detail analysis, um, no, sorry, spend distribution, I'll have a look. We'll look at the spend distribution summary. I'll just take a few seconds for that to refresh. I'll then look at the data, which is hidden underneath it. So it tells us how much is trade supplied, non-trade, unclassified and excluded. Again, we would normally filter this and exclude those that we spend less than a thousand pounds with. So we just look at what we call core trade suppliers. That then allows me to then go into the data. And this is where we're getting to the, the nuts and bolts of what's been used. What it has here is a supplier name, it has its postcode, and then it, if we were to download that, it'll tell us the spend, transactions. Directorates, departments, cost centres and subjectives, if you've reported it and passed it to us, I'll pass it to Spike Scavell. We're also looking at invoices because quite often we're seeing, if you've, if, you're, if you've got hundreds of invoices with a supplier, why aren't they being consolidated? Why is someone wasting their time processing hundreds when you could probably get them consolidated or pay them separately, pay them with a, a government procurement card, you know, the, the equivalent of a, a Bartley card? What we're also doing here is we're classifying all the suppliers. So we've used various um, supply classifications. There's one called V-code, which is vendor code, which is specifically aimed at local authorities and the public sector. We then use Proclass. Um, we're going across here, we've got Thompson. Proc HE is um, one which is used by the higher education department. 
Again, all they've done is they've allocated a category to the, to the supplier, depending on the classification. And then when we get right towards the end, we will see um, some more information here. Um, are they a charity? What's the proximity of that company, elsewhere or local? The region, the local authority they come under, and then it's the number of size for the num sorry number of employees for the size. Um, and then we have the supplier at risk category. And then finally, just some codes. And it says who bought that is Dundee City Council. Now your procurement department has got the ability to run this report, press the export button, and then manipulate the data as as in, as in how they, they need to um, to get the reports out. The, the beauty of this is you can get some very smart looking reports that you can put at a high level, which is where you want to really publish the data, you know, and say, this is, this is what we've got at the top level, and it makes sense um, for, for councillors to see, for senior management to see. They, want, they don't want to get, look at all the, the hundreds of lines of detail. They want a big picture. How much do I spend locally? How much do I spend with SMEs? How many of these suppliers are at risk? Nice, nice clear, concise graphs that way, but then the guys who are doing the work on the procurements and more detailed spend analysis, they can get into the actual nuts and bolts and what's, un what's under the bonnet, basically, to find out, is there a trend? Why is there a trend? They can actually find out, did we have a supplier we spent a fortune with last year who's dropped off? Where have they gone? Why have they gone? And they can do some analysis that way. But again, it, takes, it does take time and resource to do to do that work. Um, we scratch the surface in Scottish Government, to be perfectly honest, because Carolyn and I are a, a two-man band. So I don't get enough time to really get my hands dirty and go into more detail across the whole of the um, well, Scottish public sector spend. It's normally firefighting when the First Minister has been asked a question, and it's like, you get it right? Or, as I say, home with your tail between your legs. There's no further questions. Go on. Can I pick up on a point made by Councillor Prentice, please? And it's with regard to the um, uh, reluctance of some firms in the civil engineering sector to bid for public sector projects. Um, I'd maybe just like to highlight the work that's gone on in the last two or three years in conjunction with the Civil Engineering Contractors Association, in particular their chief executive, a gentleman called Alan Watt, and Alan has been absolutely integral in helping us develop what we call our standard pre-qualification questionnaire, which allows firms to um, portray themselves when they're registering uh, an interest in a public works project. Uh, and there's a series of standard questions and responses that these firms can, can use, and that uh, minimises the time taken, minimises their input, and the system in which the standard pre-qualification questionnaire is housed, the computer system, allows them to uh, store their responses uh, for potential reuse on similar other future public contract opportunities. So in our view, that hopefully helps the time taken and begins to break down the perceived barriers of some firms out there in terms of the accessibility of public contracts. And I mentioned the Civil Engineers Contractor Association. The standard pre-qualification questionnaire works for goods, works and services. It's public procurement across the board. There are specific questions dealing with construction, with social care as well. In other words, the big spending parts of the overall public procurement cake have standard questions that public bodies can choose to deploy if they so wish when they're sending out pre-qualification opportunities to um, to firms in the private sector. Yeah, th th thanks for that. It's just you know it, it's been a an oft sort of quoted comment out and out in the street that that uh, oh no I, I I'm not going to quote for anything you know to do with councils. It takes far far too long to go through the hoops and fill the forms and that. And, but if, if what you say is correct, that's good news. Right, there's no further questions. Can I take this opportunity to thank Callum, Laurie, Caroline and Colin uh, for coming along. Um, I think it's been very helpful to us and we'll take the information and uh, be able to have a analyse a bit more of it at our leisure and then
It will hopefully help us in our future deliberations of how we want to take procurement forward in Dumfries and Galloway. So thank you for coming today. Um, just move quickly to the recommendations. We've received the presentation, so I take it we're happy with that. And we've considered the information and evidence that this provides to the committee's review on procurement and commissioning. We're happy with that. Councillor Maitland. Yes, yes. Um, uh, Ivor, we've got to sort of, uh, I mean, at this stage, it's slightly in your hands. I mean, we've got to think about how we can use what we've just seen up on the, and I have to say, I think that last one that we saw was seriously interesting, really, really useful and really interesting, although um, we've got to treat it with a certain amount of um, respect because it's only got 60 or 70 percent, she talked about, going actually up on that, that website. But I would like to I would I would like to see how we could use that. That's what I think I'm particularly interested in. I think that'll be something that I think all of us thought it was quite interesting that to see actually where we are and it actually allowed you to identify people who weren't actually getting opportunities. So maybe that's something that we would like to see through the review to actually say if we can use the processes that were highlighted today to actually expand our uh, suppliers to allow them to have access. But, um, Lorna, have you anything else to add? Huh? My suggestion would be that uh, members might want to find out a bit more about how we're using it currently within the council um, as part of the kind of pre preparation for the next committee. You might want a formal report there, but at least to find that out in a more practical way in terms of the local information and then consider how you might want to make recommendations for its use within the council. Are the members happy to accept that we will take that uh, possibly to an evidence session or a full report to the next committee? Right. Move on to item six, scrutiny review, procurement and commissioning, uh, the presentation by Planning and Environment Services. Um, we had the workshop last Friday, which uh, had um, Mr. Sutty at it, and we have the sort of outcomes here of what was discussed that day. Is there any other points that members would like to raise in the back of this? Councillor Crothers? It isn't really points, but well, maybe is it in the appendix? Would, I'm just wondering if it's wholly, uh, wholly accurate in regards to, which is page 17. Just, I suppose, one point in in particular for Liz, who I think was there taking the, the minutes at a time, you've got paragraph one, two, you get into paragraph three, you've got bullet points. The last bullet point uh, refers to two and a half million, I think that was maybe 250k, was it? Which just says the, where the project costs more than 100k, this figure has not been changed since 1982, and it's going to say that Scottish Government has indicated this figure should remain uh, static, two point, and uh, sh should be more realistically set at two and a half million, I think it was 250k, he said. I may be wrong. I'll double check. David Sutty certainly had checked this and, and he said it was verified okay. it, but I will double check that. For right, okay. I'd like to just kind of index yeah. link it from 1992 up to there and it would be 100k. Maybe, maybe that's what I'd noted then, it was 250k. But that was only about in regards to that. And I suppose the other bit was, I suppose, in the next paragraph down where it says, he starts off, he explained, and it talks about because it is important for public trust and transparency that the council is subject to the same degree of scrutiny as the private sector. I've wrote any other applicant, rather well, the private sector, because it's you've got third sector, private sector, it, just any other any other applicant that was coming in. I think there's more that reference there, and that was all. That was all. Sorry, that was only a point as, as I read through his notes that I picked up on. Is there any other questions on this report? No. Um. Turn to recommendations then. Members are asked to consider the evidence and information presented during the presentation by the service manager, felt planning and environment service as detailed in the appendix. We're happy with that. And we're asked to agree this should be added to the evidence gathered for the procurement and commissioning scrutiny review. Happy to do that. All right. Move on to item seven. Scrutiny review. Procurement and Commissioning presentation by DG First. This is the 
one of the other ones that was on Friday, um, number of issues had been identified during an earlier study of a sample of capital property projects and uh, they were questioned um, Mr Dempster when he arrived. So is there any questions on the report that we have in front of us? Councillor Maitland. Um, just, just, I, I can't remember, well, question two, bottom of page 23, um, sort of early involvement and formal project review. Um, is that, is that auditable? I mean, it is, it is, if it's formal project review, I presume it's written down and we can see what's going to flow from it. Is that right? Is that, that what I took from that? What Ronnie had talked about was sitting down um, after the project was completed and rating up lessons learned. So it wasn't just a, I think he did refer sometimes to perhaps conversations that take place perhaps between a couple of officers, but he did highlight that there is a sit down and a formal record taken um, of the, the project review. If there's no further questions, the recommendations are similar to the last one, where we consider them and agree that this goes forward as evidence. Um, move on to item 8, which is the Procurement Commissioning Presentation on Audit Scotland Procurement and Council's Report by Chief Executive Service. This was the, I think it was the third of the three presentations we had last report to summary of the activity undertaken in relation to the Procurement Commission review and the next steps to conclude the first phase of the procurement. Uh, as you'll see in page 38, it's planned to take evidence from four other councils and arrangements are being finalised for a visit to North Ayrshire on 4th or 11th of July, both East Renfrewshire and Renfrewshire on 22nd of August and to meet with representative of Aberdeen City Council in Edinburgh on a date yet to be advised. Um, the date and time of our next preparatory workshop is also being identified for late August as we've used the date to go and see the other councils. Uh, calendar invites and travel arrangements will be issued from democratic support as soon as possible and background material will be provided nearer the date on each of the host council's arrangements. Um, Liz is here to answer any questions. Councillor Maitland. Um, it's not on that, um, Chairman. It, it's really uh, just to ask about how we're getting on with the, the issue about detailed discussion on how health and social care commissioning fit in. Um, I see that that um, is to be done in September, and I wonder if we could have an update as to how we're getting on with that. We've certainly issued the invitations to college and third sector and NHS, but we have said to them that because commissioning is going to be your next phase um, that we'll come back to them about the actual date that we would like them to come. Um, so they're very willing to come along and speak to us. Um, the principle's been established, but the date is just to be finalised once we've got a better idea. Um, if I could just pick up, actually, there was two things that arose this morning that I think when we were talking about Scotland Excel's rule, I think Councillor Mill was, was asking about that. When we go to the Renfrewshire Councils, um, one of them actually hosts Scotland Excel. Um, so there'll be an opportunity, perhaps, that's one of the areas that we might like to pick up with them about what advantage does it make having um, Scotland Excel um, right next door, because certainly I think Rona had mentioned at the preparatory workshop that their improvement had um, been significantly better than other councils, and part of that was they thought because Scotland Excel were very close to them and they were able to get that advice. So we could pick that point up with them when we visit and also, um, Laurie picked up there about um, North Ayrshire was one of the councils involved in the database, so we could maybe talk to them about their use of it and how they interrogate it. Um, although I, I think you mentioned they were one of the ones that hadn't been able to spend the time sort of really delving into it, but perhaps by the time we go there in August, they'll have had that opportunity. And I'm sure if we tell them we're going to ask about it, <laughs> I'm sure somebody over the, their, summer, their summer period will, will make a point of taking some time. So we can pick these two things up when we go and do the visits. If there's no other issues with that one, we have the note 
progress and actions taken for the procurement. Happy to note that. And agree and review and agree the next steps for the scrutiny review as set out in appendix. With that, uh, I have no other business and I would like to thank members for their attendance. Uh, as you will notice, uh, later this week there is a report on full council which deals with um, proportionality and membership of committees. My understanding is that the numbers on this committee will change. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for their participation in this committee if they are unfortunately removed because uh, other people are coming to join this committee. Um, I think we started to move things bit by bit in the right direction. The last, uh, the first review was a good one. Uh, we got that through full council. I think that's really a thumbs up for us. We must have done it right. Um, this one's interesting and uh, hopefully, is it September, October full council? We're hoping to get phase one finished. Yeah, so hopefully we get this one on the card ready for the next full council after September. Uh, because I think this one is important for us going forward, uh, leading to budget decisions and stuff. So thank you all, and I hope to see all of you here <laughs> uh, in the future. Um, but thanks for the contributions you've done to the committee so far and in the future.